Hello everybody, my name is Elliot Kimmel, high school science teacher, and this is my mini tutorial on population dynamics. I'm going to be going through some of the questions that students in my class have on the four problem sets that deal with population dynamics um, from the Nelson Biology 12 textbooks. So this is not going to be uh, everything there is to know about population dynamics and it, may not, it might not relate to students um, taking other courses on population dynamics. It's relevant uh, to students at Central Secondary School. So here we have an image that could represent some kind of a forest ecosystem. And you can see we've got a number of birds in the sky, land animals, and of course in the soil and in the plants, there are going to be a lot of microorganisms. So the concept that I want to get across here is something about population density, all right? Uh, population density is the number of organisms in a particular area, volume, uh, space, whatever. Smaller organisms tend to have higher population densities, uh, and this is because uh, they take up less space, first of all. Uh, they use less nutrients. So here we can see some bacteria versus very large organisms, the elephants, that you can see they are clustered together. There's a high population density here, but there's much more of a higher population density in the bacteria than in the elephants themselves. So now we have a pond with a number of fish and we want to calculate the population density. So population density equals the number of organisms divided by the space or divided by the volume or the area. So in this case, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight purple fishes or fish in this pond here. So we're gonna have eight divided by the space or the area. So we've got three meters by two meters. So that's gonna be six meters squared. And this is eight fish. And so when we divide these out, we're gonna get an approximate population density of 1.3 fish per meter squared. All right, so that's how we calculate the population density. And obviously, if we had a lot more fish here, we'd have a large number of organisms per meter squared. Now, the difference between crude and ecological density is what I just calculated was a crude density for this area here, saying we had, you know, eight fish by six meters squared. But these fish, of course, are not utilizing the land. They're not on the plants here, which is all part of the calculation here for the space involved with population density. So the crude density was what we just calculated, but the ecological density is the area that's actually used by the organism. So of course, they're, you know, they're not on the lily pad here or on the flower, they're just in the water. So the ecological density is going to be smaller than the crude density. So populations, of course, do not remain static. They change over time. And the reasons that they change, if we look at this little island here, is imagine that we've got an organism over here, we've got an organism over there, and these guys reproduce, and there are more organisms on this little island here. And that would represent the births. So as individuals are born, they are going to increase the population size. Sadly, some of these organisms are going to die. So let's say this guy goes and this guy goes and that guy goes and that's going to change the population size as well. So now we're talking about deaths. So we have births that influence population size. We have deaths that influence population size. And then along they come swimming through the water, landing on the island and they decided, hey, I like this island. And so they've joined here. So we have some immigration to the island and that's going to increase the population size and then this one says oh, I'm out of here and this one says okay I'll join you and they leave and so we have emigration as well so we have these factors that influence the population size birth death immigration and emigration all causing changes in the original population number or the population size
So let's ha have a look at an actual calculation of changes in population size. Here we can see that for these birds, births occur and that's going to increase or add to a population size deaths occur and that could be due to predation or just natural causes or disease or whatever and that's going to remove uh, individuals from the from the population we have immigration adding to the population and emigration as they leave so let's imagine we have this problem here all right and let's calculate the change in the population size so um, let's call this population growth. And of course, growth can be negative or positive. Usually when somebody's growing, right, we think they're getting tall or whatever. We don't think of them as getting shorter. We always think of it as a positive thing. But population growth or population change um, can be either positive or negative. So what we're going to get is population growth or change is equal to births plus immigration all right, those two things are going to increase the population size minus deaths and emigration, and those are going to decrease the population size. This is going to be divided by the original number of the population, and we're going to multiply this by 100 because we'll get um, a percent or a decimal or something like that. Okay, so the number of births in this example is 50 plus the immigration is 17 so we've got that minus the deaths which are 22 and the emigration which is 8 we're going to multiply this by 100 and we're going to divide it all by the original population of 38 so when we do the math we're going to come up with 67 individuals that have been added to the population minus 30 individuals that have been removed from the population divided by our 38 times 100 so we're going to end up with 37 individuals whereas we had 38 in the population at first times 100 so we're going to get around uh, 0 0.97 and when we multiply it we're going to get around 97 percent so what we can see is that the population has declined by about three percent uh, due to the births and immigration, deaths and immigration, the population has declined. So that is a change in the population size right there. Now, another concept that we need to deal with is that of dispersion patterns. And dispersion patterns are how organisms are spread out in the, in, in the environment. And here we can see some penguins that are exhibiting something called uniform dispersion. We've got some grass and flowers that are random, and we've got some elephants that are clumped. So a uniform uh, dispersion is just as it sounds, where the organisms are very spread out in very balanced um, fashion, uh, very uniformly, very organized, all right? And this is not a very common pattern um, it is exhibited by some organisms uh, this does not by the way this image which does go with uniform does not look like this is uniform dispersion this actually looks more like it's clump dispersion all right but these are the images that went with this particular graphic and is trying to illustrate it i don't think it's the greatest one now that i have a close look at it um, but this can occur when organisms are going through their mating season like a bunch of birds on an island or something and they need a particular amount of room don't worry i'm not going to put a check mark beside everyone and they need a certain amount of room between the the breeding couples so they'll spread out uniformly uh uniform dispersion is also seen uh, when say farmers plant their fields and they've you know they put down the, the rows of corn or wheat or whatever and we get this uniform dispersion random dispersion is what you would tend to expect with um things like trees uh, with with grass with flowers that you know wherever the seeds land and take root that's where they grow so you get this very randomized uh, type of dispersion now of course there are interactions between these plants all right um, and between the grasses uh, they release chemicals that sort of um, keep other plants away from them a little bit so that they can have access to the nutrients below the soil there is actually some interaction between 
these organisms. And so there, it's not exactly random, but it's a good approximation. So we're just going to leave it at that. Many organisms exhibit clumped dispersion patterns like this uh, group of elephants that are on the go together or organisms that hunt together or feed together um, for protection, for providing for the offspring, whatever. Schools of fish, flocks of birds, all of that thing. Okay, so uniform, random, and clump dispersion patterns are the ones that we are concerned with. All right, on to survivorship curves. Now, survivorship curves come in three types. There is type 1, type 2, and type 3. And when we look, let's have a look at the axis here. We're looking at the survivorship or the number of, of individuals that are surviving over time. The percent of their lifespan, or over here, the age and relative units. All right, so this is the number of organisms here on the Y over their lifetime. And there are three types of curves, all right? Now, don't worry about the fact that the colors are different here, all right? But you can see type one, type two, and type three, and they look the same in both of the graphics. Type one survivorship curve is illustrating high survivorship until late in life, and then there's a high mortality. And this is the typical pattern that that humans go through, that elephants, um, stuff like where um, the individuals are born and many of them survive at birth and they live a long life and then later in life there is high mortality. So there's a good long life here and then as they get to a certain age, then they die off rapidly. All right, elephants do this, humans do this, stuff like that. Let's contrast that with the type 3 survivorship, which is somewhat different. This is low survivorship early in life, but if they survive that period, they do tend to live a long life. So, for example, trees and stuff, just imagine um, how many seeds are released, how much pollen is released. Um, the survivorship is very low for these organisms early on, so you see them, them dropping off early in their life cycle many of them don't make it and then those that do though tend to live a nice long time so think of trees in the forest right and trees in the rainforest some of them are hundreds of years old if they took root and survived they can live a really long time same thing with sea turtles all right they there's lots of offspring but the chance of them surviving is very low but if they do survive, they live a long time. They become old and wise, like grandma here. All right. Right in the middle, we have a fairly constant death rate. So, for example, for birds um, the, the, or squirrels, um, the chance of, of survival is, is it's hit or miss. And it's pretty constant all throughout their lifetime. So it's just this linear relationship. All right. So survivorship curves, type 1 curve type 2 curve, and type 3 curve. Let's talk about density-dependent and density-independent factors in uh, ecology. A factor that influences population regulation having a greater impact as the population density increases usually or decreases. Usually we think of increases as things that are um, going to be affected by density-dependent factors. Examples of density-dependent factors are competition. So here we have an image of some, some cattle, um, herds of animals anyhow, um, on the plains, in the grassland, wherever they may be, and they are competing for resources. They're competing for food. They are competing for shelter and for mates. And all of that is a density-dependent factor. I mean, it depends on how many of them. And the more that there are, the more interactions there is and the less shelter there's going to be available or the less mates there are going to be available. Um, 
predation can uh, affect be a, sort of a density dependent factor because here comes the predator i know that's not a predator but just imagine and there's a whole bunch of them you pick off this one or this one or this one that kind of thing so as the number or the population size increases as the population density increases this factor becomes more important there's more of them to be attacked um, disease is often also found in high population numbers because the, the, this guy gets sick there and can pass it to this one and to this one and to this one because it's in such close proximity to these ones. So the increased population density uh, lends itself to the transmission of disease. So this concept of intraspecific competition is what I was talking about before as a density dependent factor the more the population density increases organisms in the same population or species will compete for resources in their habitat so on the grassland they are competing against each other it's not like a lion attacking um, you know a gazelle or something like that they're of the same species competing for the same thing so again competing for um, shelter or for mates or for food all of the same resources so this is a dense these are density dependent factors they depend on the density of the population and they can regulate or limit the population now we've been talking about increases in population density well there's something called the alley effect which is where a density dependent factor acts at low population size and i give the example of this bird here imagine that instead of there being a lot of birds and this little guy or gal is competing for food and mates and shelter and all of that stuff imagine if there are very few of these birds now the odds that it will get to mate are actually quite low despite the fact that there might be lots of worms or lots of seeds and space and all of that stuff if the population gets too low then they can't mate properly and even if they could mate uh, there might be some inbreeding going on where you know they're mating with each other and with siblings and stuff like that so they're not going to have a healthy population this is called the alley effect which is somewhat contrary to what you might think when you think of an increase in population density causing all these things right it's obvious we're going to have to compete for this stuff well if the numbers are too low the alley effect kicks in which is a density dependent factor with respect for the most part to mating you can think of it that way if you have a low population mating is now a density dependent factor i mean it depends on the density of individuals to have mating the density happens to be low so not a lot of mating going on and this this can lead to the extinction of a species density independent factors are factors that influence a population or the population density regardless of the actual population density itself all right so they influence the population but regardless of what the population density is so for example things like weather uh, wind hurricanes earthquakes um, humid conditions droughts all of those things that don't specifically depend on how many individuals they are there are uh, it just comes along and it and it has an has an effect this would be a density independent factor um, if you look at this image here i've tried to find one where the crops you know kind of look like they're not that healthy um it doesn't matter how many individuals are out here grazing all right um if the crops are not healthy then they're not getting good uh, nutrition and that can influence the population size uh, that can influence whether or not they mate or how they produce all the chemicals they need the hormones the gametes uh, the, the nutritional quality is very important and that's a density independent factor the food quality and also humans um, indirectly affect the population density when we spray insecticides or pesticides um, sure that is you know affecting organisms in the grass here or in the crop killing them or whatever um, but it's not dependent so much on their numbers influencing each other this is something that we've done and so it's considered a density independent factor 
Now, the last concept that I want to talk about in this particular video is one of symbiosis. And you've probably seen this before. Sim referring to same bio for life, so same life. So uh, individuals living together, usually in physical proximity, um, having an effect on the other one's life. And there are three types. We've got mutualism, parasitism, and commensalism. In mutualism, both organisms will have some form of benefit. So here we see a bird in the crocodile's mouth. The bird is feeding on some debris left in the crocodile's mouth, so, so the bird is going to gain here. The crocodile gains by having his teeth cleaned out. Maybe there's some microbial life living in there that would be harmful for the, for the crocodile. So the crocodile also gains, so it's a mutual relationship. This is called symbiosis, and there are plenty of examples in nature where organisms live together, work together, um, and they both benefit. And this is a form of symbiosis called mutualism. Parasitism is probably quite familiar to you, dealing with parasites. In this case, one benefits and one is harmed. Or one, yeah, one, it's not that one doesn't benefit, it's that one is actually harmed. Here we see the malaria carrying mosquito on some human skin. And so the, the mosquito is feeding, of course, taking in the blood, getting the nourishment that it needs. So the mosquito is gaining, but the human, the host in this case, is losing in that it's losing its blood going into the mosquito. And this, so that's a bad thing for the host, but it also may be getting some of the malaria germs. And that, of course, is going to be negative as well. So this is parasitism. Another example is the tapeworm uh, living in an intestine of some organism, the tapeworm gaining the nutrients, the host losing those nutrients. And so that tapeworm is called a parasite, or this is a parasite. So this is a type of symbiosis, a type of living together, um, which is parasitism. Finally, we have commensalism, in which case one organism benefits and the other is unaffected or has no, has no benefit and no harm. Here we have a shark and some fish living around that shark. These fish tend to follow that shark around and these fish are protected by the shark because the shark is a good hunter. Um, of course, they may also get the debris of whatever the shark eats. All right, some of that the fish get. So they get protection, they might get food as well, but they really do not in any way benefit the shark. So I put a zero there or put a line through it. No benefit, no harm to the shark. Uh, so this is commensalism. It's a one-way street. One benefits and the other is unaffected. All right, so that's all that I wanted to talk about in this short video tutorial. Thank you for watching.